Carl Denham. Ever hear of me? Yes. Yes. You make moving pictures in jungles and places. That's right. And I picked you for the lead in my next picture. Don't go to the camera. Let the camera come to you. And I thought that was good advice and I would take it myself because uh, if you're doing something that you believe in and it's honest and true in your own imagination, the camera will find it. The fiction is that you have to work for the camera. You have to do something special for the camera. You don't. You just have to be true to the scene and the camera will find you. But the camera will find you, I said. And I meant that. I still do mean that. My men will come in and kill you. Let them kill me. I'd be glad to die if I could rid Mexico of you. Go on, call your soldiers now. Now! You! Get out! Does this come under the heading of science or art? Whichever it is, you have definite possibilities. Asked you the right questions? I thought you did. Yeah, to show them I'm no bum, I wouldn't... I wouldn't break in some place, just steal some wine and beer. <laughs> and you knowing me as long as you have, never seeing me drunk. Ah, maybe it helps, I don't know. Sure, they all saw that. Lord had done it better. A year passed by and William Graham found himself married not to the woman he loved, but to a machine. Not to the little girl he went to school with, but to a front page character with an insatiable thirst for more publicity and more fame. His home wasn't his any longer. It was his wife's. Just a meeting place for her business associates. A place forever filled with incessantly dull law talk. William Graham never left his wife, ladies and gentlemen. She drove him out. This is actual enough. I was planning on day parole for her, finding her a job in Ventura during the day. Oh, what kind of job? Sewing, light assembly work. There's several plants in town that take our girls. No, no, Miss Perry. It seems to me that she's reserved and withdrawn enough. I have a feeling she might be helped more in some job where she'd meet people. Perhaps. But if she blows up so easily, it would be asking her employer to take some risk. No, I think I know one who would. Yes, it's all right, Mr. Cullen. As long as you make it clear to him that she's long on brains and short on temper. Oh, no. Come. No, no. Come. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Let me Nice palace with soft cushions and everything. And you bring me to a place. 
place like this with no cushions at all. Ah. Are you all right? Yes. Are you sure? Uh-huh. Can, can, can you come out? Oh, yes, of course. You sure you're all right? Oh, yes, please don't worry. Oh. How awful. You'll have to be towed in. Oh, that's all right. I'm just grateful I didn't hit you. My house is right here on the corner if you'd like to use the telephone. Oh, well, that would be very kind of you. I'm supposed to be my husband for lunch. Oh, of course, but I'd be happy to drive you to him. Oh, no, that would be too much of an imposition. I'm to meet him downtown Los Angeles, police headquarters. Police headquarters? Yes, he's a detective in the Central Division. Lieutenant. When I first came to California, I was 14, and, and, and just did a, a few bit parts. And when I was 16, I started working with cowboys, and I did two, two reelers and four reelers. And... I remember having to look up at the leading man who was perhaps still had a little smell of liquor on his breath. <laughs> That's true. I'm telling the truth. I, you know, these cowboys who were leading men, they, they, they didn't have any ambition beyond just little two or three reelers, you know. That was good enough for them. And so they liked to have a little schnapps. I guess. <laughs> I'd never had a drink in my life. We were not allowed, any, there, nothing, not even wine in, in, in the house I was brought up in. But it was a little bit difficult to look up and, and look at them with adoration. <laughs> day I would I would pick up a girl named Janet Gaynor she didn't have a car my mother helped me get a, an old second-hand car so that I could go to the studio and um, I would pick her up and take her with me to work at the Hell Road studio and both of us got just little little bits and pieces to do in uh, better than extra it was a little bit better than extra but it was work, you know. And Janet had friends, I think, at Universal. And I, I also made friends with a, a very nice person who, who was related to the Lemley people. So it, it made it easy to get established at Universal. Universal was a much bigger studio than Hal Roach was, except that it was, it was very, rough looking at that time. It was just like something in the country, way out in the country. But um, you'd have to get up very early in the morning to go to work at Universal because they, they shot everything outside in the country and they depended upon daylight for the lighting. And uh, it was a little bit rough to have to get up at 4.30, I guess it was, to say that the latest you could get up at 4.30. <laughs> but, um, and th they had things called reflectors. Th that would be squ big square boards that were covered with material that would reflect the sun. And so that would bit into your, your feelings too, your eyes and your, uh, you, it took away all the comfort from life. <laughs> 
to say the least. Then there was a man at the studio, the leading man was Hoot Gibson. That's quite a name, isn't it? Hoot. Hoot. <laughs> Hoot Gibson. However, it was work and, and I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed working. I loved being able to have money to give my mother because she needed help, my the family needed help. And, and, and helping was always very important to me. So anyhow, uh, at Universal, I never got beyond doing two or three real movies. And I was very ambitious in my heart. I wanted everything, everything, yeah. Did yes, you? I wanted a beautiful part for myself. They were doing that particular scene when uh, I had to simulate uh, being f scared when I saw first saw Kong. And there's something else I must tell you too. You know, that's one of my favorite scenes. You smile <laughs> a little, then you listen, and then you laugh. All right? Come on. Now this was 1933. Do you think that it could have helped that five years earlier you were working in silent films? that your technique was born in silent films? Because a lot of what you're doing, you're communicating everything with your face. Yes, that's true. That, well, that is really quite true. Yeah, yes. I didn't have to make any sounds at all until the last moment, or last few seconds, right? I just knew that I had to keep in motion. I mean, it had to be an interesting scene. Uh, and I figured uh, about where I would put my hands, my arms, how I would keep it alive until that moment, you know, when they told me that I was supposed to scream and did. That Marion Cooper said to me, scream, Faye, scream for your life. Well, who wouldn't? <laughs> Even if you could only just imagine a, a, a giant creature like of that kind, you know? Right. Perhaps if you didn't see it, you could scream. Throw your arms across your eyes and scream, man. Scream for your life! That's exactly what he said. Scream for your life. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you did. And I did. And it yeah. became the most famous scream in the history of American motion I don't pictures. know why that scream, because other people scream, and I don't think that, I think my scream is supposed to be a little more, you know, more well known or appreciated than most screams. But I don't understand that really exactly. But I'll take it if, it, if that serves <laughs> to be something that people can appreciate. That was done in one take. That's all, just one take. Because um, I planned what I wanted to do ahead of time, did it, and that was, they were satisfied with that. Just one take. That's why I like silent films too. Because you, you can express a lot without talking. You really can. That stood you in good stead in King Kong. Yes, yeah, I think so. But I enjoyed that scene because I helped, I created that scene. I enjoyed doing that very much, yeah. It was my scene. <laughs> I had been at Columbia doing a lot of B pictures. But what I wanted was a part that uh, just had some character that wasn't just decorative, you know. I, th I thought most of the time I was being given roles that just 
They, they liked how I looked. And then suddenly they gave me a role in uh, uh, Ann Carver's profession, written by Robert Riskin. And Robert Riskin was a very interesting, good, good writer. And oh, everything lighted up for me. Aren't you happy for me, Bill? Of course I am, Bill. And think of all the things we can do. We get a bigger house, car maybe, and lots of clothes, Bill. I'm going to get just oodles and oodles of clothes. Be right back, sweet. Got lots and lots to tell you about the trial. There's a look within your eye that makes me realize there's love in the moonlight for me all this night. So that was an A picture. Well, it was a B plus. <laughs> there was no such thing as an A picture in Columbia then. <laughs> Not until later when uh, it happened one night that was written by Robert Riskin, won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Well, you see, my family had an idea that I ought to teach school. I wanted to get someplace in the world, be somebody. I always wanted to write, be a novelist, you know. I've written a play, uh -huh. and, and sketches, and short things, and articles, but this is my first book, and I'm delighted to. I've I had it in my thoughts to do for a long, long time, so uh, to realize it and be able to um, give it to, with affection to the people who like movies. I always gravitated toward writers because I, I like the idea of being, having someone really to talk to, you know? I was married uh, to John Mark Saunders. He was a writer. He wrote Wings. Yes, he wrote Wings. First movie to win the Academy Award. That's right. And I was married to Robert Riskin, who was it also happened a wonderful night. writer. He wrote uh, It Happened One Night. He wrote Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. And I, and I had a brief... Um, romance with another fine writer, um, Clifford Odets, which was of not very long duration. Howard Hughes, yeah. Well, I had known him slightly long before because he had been a friend of my husband's. Now, when I met him when I was in a summer theater, uh, it had a more romantic uh, tone to it. He had just come from uh, flying around the world, and then he went to this party, and I went to that party. And he, it's true, he didn't look very well groomed. He, his belt was kind of, you know, loose, and, 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 and his clothes were raggedy looking. But the ladies there just were whispering behind their hands about Howard Hughes, and how un unattractive he looked, and instead of appreciating that he had just flown around the world and had just had a ticker tape par parade. And I felt bad about that. And so my sympathies went toward him, and maybe he knew that I, I was willing to talk to him where other people wouldn't. He, he didn't look good enough for <laughs> these elegant ladies to talk <laughs> to. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Uh, yeah, it's just amazing. But then he drove me to the theater where I was going to be acting. And then he, he uh, drove me to the theater more than once. <laughs> but, but, you Did know, you fall in love with him? No, I liked him. I liked him. I was very attracted to him. He was so, um, he seemed so lonely. But I think that, that he, uh, probably just wanted to add my affections to his list. And you were looking for more? 
Oh, so much more, yes, so much more, yes. Yeah. Fan mail. I do get fan mail. Try and answer here. it sometimes? Is, is uh, it, is but, no, I never answer it. I just say thank you. <laughs> I've enjoyed the time that I've spent in motion pictures, and why shouldn't I? I mean, it's too easy sometimes to, to find uh, things to blame. I, I just don't believe in that. I, I, I want to be an, I'm an appreciator. Okay, Faye. What, what, Donna? We're on an adventure. We sure are. We're going back on the road. <laughs> I think we do have the most wonderful time. We just don't, don't, don't know what's, what's going to happen the next minute, do we? No, we don't know from moment to moment. <laughs> and why should we? <laughs> Time's too short. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>